Well, good evening. A great pleasure to welcome those who are here in the hall and to welcome those who join us online. I'm always uh, encouraged and amazed how many people do manage to tune in on a Wednesday night uh, who can't be here in person and how many catch up in the course of a week. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very well attended midweek uh, time of worship and we're thankful for that and we'd love uh, for there to be a growing uh, support for in-person gatherings like this uh, for those who can make it along. We're conscious some of the church family are away on holiday uh, with the schools being off over Easter break and we do pray much refreshing and encouragement for those who are away traveling or visiting loved ones at this time of year. And tonight it's lovely to welcome visitors in this gathering as well uh, and to have a family all the way from Utah in the United States joining us for worship tonight. May God meet with us and bless us in our gathering. Tonight we'll be thinking a little about heaven, which is a wonderful topic worthy, I'm sure, of much study. But maybe we can have a wee uh, overview of some of the Bible's teaching about heaven and uh, bring that into our thoughts, into our meditation, maybe into our prayers as well. And that's maybe very fitting in this Easter season when we think of new life in Christ, of the risen Lord uh, who has ascended and who gives life to his people. Uh, what a hope we have, not only for our souls, but for our very bodies and for the future, for God to make a new world, to renew creation and to raise the dead. We have a wonderful hope. We're going to sing about that hope in Psalm 23, in Christopher Idol's version of Psalm 23, which we usually sing to the tune Brother James's air. The Lord my shepherd rules my life. John's going to lead us. If you're at home, you might find the words in the praise hymn book, uh, 23A, if you've got that at home. So let's stand, if we're able, and sing Psalm 23. The Lord my shepherd rules my life and gives me all I need. He leads me by refreshing streams in pastures green I feed. He leads me by refreshing streams in pastures Yeah. 
Passages of scripture, and after the reading, I'd be glad if Donnie would come and lead us in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we worship you together this evening through our Saviour and Mediator with God, the Lord Jesus Christ. We recognize that we could not dare, could not possibly know you or draw near to your presence without the safety and protection of a mediator, a representative who stands between us and your holiness and beauty and perfection. Our hearts are filled with wonder that the one who chooses to stand between us and God is himself fully God and fully human. The unique, the wonderful, the glorious Lord Jesus, God in the flesh, Emmanuel. Help us, Lord, to love our Saviour better, to love the Word of God and to love the company and companionship of God's saints. God's holy people. Still our hearts and grant us um, an attitude of reverence and worship, of humility, of thankfulness while we are together and when we are alone and apart. We pray your blessing on those who are here who are Christians and growing in the faith and fruitful. We pray your blessing on those who may be here or listening who are not sure what they believe, that clarity and deep conviction would be granted to us all. We pray that you would help us to share our joy and faith and peace with those who do not have a basis for these things because they do not have you. Lord, we long for conversions. We long for men and women and young people to be added to the family of God. Help us faithfully to pray, both in general terms and maybe in very specific ways, for your saving work to take place in many a heart and life. Lord, nothing is too hard for you. As we reflect on your word tonight, may you bless the reading of your word and the word explained and applied. And as we think about the wonderful topic of heaven, may we remember that heaven is heaven because it is your dwelling place. Heaven is glory because your glorious face is there. Heaven is a place of joy and life and worship because of the worthy God whose dwelling it is. Oh, that we would love you, not just your gifts and blessings. Oh, that we would rush in faith towards you. Come now, Lord, and speak to us. And even these familiar scriptures we are about to read, cause them to come alive, that you would have the praise and the honour and the glory. Cover and forgive our many sins and renew us in the love of Jesus. Bless all who are in our prayers day by day. Hear us and be our helper. Amen. The words of Jesus in John 14 at the beginning. Jesus, after washing his disciples' feet, 
says to them, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And in 2 Corinthians and in chapter 12, Paul has been speaking sometimes quite sharply to the Corinthians who've been misled by false teachers, proud and boastful so-called apostles who've caused them to turn away from their apostle and those who taught them the way of Jesus. And so he wants to have a word with them about what they should boast or glory in. 2 Corinthians 12, I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses, and so on. May God bless the reading of his inspired, perfect, holy word. And Donnie, I'd be glad if you'd lead us in prayer. Lord, we give thanks to you for your precious word. Words that were read that are very familiar and are often read in various occasions. We thank you, Lord, that your word is ever new. It's a living word. It's quick and it's powerful. And thank you, Lord, that we can find great comfort in your word. We can find such hope we can find the way to, to live. We can find out all about ourselves and our own need. And Lord, we pray that as we come together this evening that we would see something afresh and anew of the wonder of your word. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful subject that we're looking at tonight of heaven. We thank you, Lord, that this is the place where your people go. Thank you that you, a place is prepared, you've done this. Thank you, Lord, that we don't need to live in, in doubt, as it were. But your word tells us that these things are written, that we might know that we have eternal life. We thank you for all the promises that are in your word. Thank you that they're sure and certain they will never fail. But Lord, we fail, and we sin, and we fall short. But we thank you that with you there is forgiveness. And we thank you for the cleansing power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
will never lose its power. No, never. No, never. And so we praise you tonight for all you mean to us and all you are to us and all you have been and all you will be. And we pray that we would be clinging more and more to you, close to the rock, the rock Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for each other. Thank you that we can remember each other before you. Those that are not able to be here tonight, we remember them. There's some would love to be. Some are not well and have not been well for some time. And Lord, we lift them up before you and pray, O oh Lord, for your gracious hand of strength and help to be their portion. We pray, O oh Lord, for families tonight and every family connected with the congregation. And there's, we pray for those in our families who are not walking with the Lord, who don't know you yet. And we lift them up before you, children and grandchildren, and perhaps great-grandchildren in some cases. And Lord, we, we ask you that in your power and grace and mercy you would reach out to them as you alone can, that you would draw them to yourself, that they might be stopped in their tracks as it were, and that they would come under a great concern for their own souls. They would see that need and cry out to Almighty God, the one who is able to save to the uttermost. Lord, we thank you that that's a prayer that you always answer. When a seeking soul comes and cries out to God, thank you, Lord, that your word reminds us that you will never turn anyone like this away. And so we praise you. Thank you, Lord, for the, the work with the Sunday school and the young people and the youth fellowship as well. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless that work, that you would minister into the hearts of our young people, that they would grow to know and to, to love the Savior and to be found walking with him all the days of their lives. We pray, O oh Lord, for those on holiday, those who are away at this time, that you would watch over them and protect them and keep them, that they would know refreshing and blessing. We thank you, Lord, for the services week by week and it's for all who do come in and for all who are able to tune in online. And over this past while, we've had many visitors in and we thank you for that and we pray for them too as they come and as they go. We thank you for them and pray your blessing, your peace, your hand to be upon them and with them. And so, Lord, we look to you. Thank you for Angus, our minister. Thank you for the help that you give him in preparing the word for tonight. And we ask that you would help him as he brings that word to us and that there be a word from the Lord to all of our hearts, that we might be so encouraged and blessed that there be such a, a great sense of your presence among us, the presence of God that makes the feast. Come to us, we pray. Thank you for Carrie, and for the work that she does, many aspects of it, for the Lighthouse Biblical Counseling that goes on and those who are touched and helped through this. We give thanks for the Bible studies and the visits and the other aspects of the, the work that she's involved in. We thank you and pray that together we would uphold each other in prayer. As we go on, may we go on in the strength of God. May we know that uplifting grace that comes from you. May we know that reviving power that you alone can give. Lord, strengthen us this night, we pray, that we might leave this place with a spring in our steps, as it were, because we have been in the presence of God, and you have met with us, and we have met with you. And that's life-transforming. We pray for that life-transforming power of God. Oh, come to us, Lord. We're a needy people. We need you so much. And so, Lord, we to spread this time out before you, that you would have your way and that you'd be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
It's always a pleasure, always a joy to gather for worship, Sunday by Sunday, midweek by midweek. And we are so thankful for the blessing of God over the Easter season as well. We had some great times of worship. We want to give thanks to God for that. Before Easter, we were thinking... Uh, on Wednesday evenings about uh, a traditional category uh, that Christians have spoken about since at least the Middle Ages, the four last things. And these four last things are, some of them rather challenging, rather difficult to think about, difficult to talk about. They are things that we all face. They are death, And they are judgment by Almighty God according to his holy word. And they are heaven and hell, the four last things. Now we've already spent a Wednesday night thinking about death and thinking about judgment. And that sparked off some discussion uh, about uh, what we might be looking forward to in terms of even rewards and things like that that are a whole other area uh, to unpack maybe for another time but tonight in this easter week we've come to the thought the thought about heaven and i think it's a, a much more comforting a uh, thought about the future that we can talk about heaven except that heaven is not a good topic, a desirable topic, if you don't want more of God and more of holiness and more of truth. If you hate God, to be with God forever will be terrifying. If you hate God's truth, God's righteousness, God's beauty, God's purity, you wouldn't want to be in the presence of God. Not for a second, let alone for eternity. And so when Christians through the centuries have thought about these things, they have thought about them biblically and sensibly. And when we come to talk about heaven, we have to acknowledge that the Bible is very restrained in what it says. And that we should not speculate beyond what the Bible leads us to believe. There's quite a veil drawn over what heaven and hell both are all about. We are told about these realities in fairly general terms and pictorial terms with symbolism and imagery. And we accept what God says in his word and we accept that God has not revealed everything to us, but that he has revealed enough that we might have his peace and his joy and that we might go into the future with hope and with confidence as his children. I came across something uh, in my reading this week, a question. Who doesn't want to go to heaven? And you would expect that everybody would want to go to heaven and survey after survey would suggest that if you ask this question, In this country or in Europe or in North America, a a huge number of people, if they believe in an afterlife, are pretty confident that they're going to a good place, that they're going to heaven. But the thing is, if you explain heaven in biblical terms, with biblical categories, I think a lot of the people that we work with and that we know people in our families would then say, well, that sounds boring. That doesn't sound like it's for me. 
If you don't want God now, why would you want God in the future? And so I think talking about heaven is comforting, wonderful, reassuring if you know Jesus, but it's actually quite a challenging thing if you don't know Jesus, because heaven is saying, do you want to taste and see that God is good and go on tasting and go on not just tasting but feasting on God forever? To quote Sinclair Ferguson, the most wonderful thing to know about heaven is that Jesus is there. Now, if you're a Christian, you immediately nod your head and you say, that's right, the most wonderful thing about heaven is that my Lord is there. But if you're not a Christian, Jesus, you maybe shrug your shoulders. Well, so what? I'm managing my life fine without Jesus. Why would I want to go and be with Jesus? So really... I think it's worth asking, even on a Wednesday night, even in a small gathering where we maybe assume we're all believers, do we want Jesus? And do we want to build everything on him? And if the honest answer is no, we need to be changed. We need to be born of God's Holy Spirit. We need a new beginning. We need to understand that we are living a half-life in the dark without our Creator, without knowing our purpose. So to talk about heaven is not just to sing kumbaya and be sentimental. To talk about heaven is to ask the vital question, do we worship the God for whom the whole universe exists? Heaven is a place that is anticipating the whole creation being the home and the dwelling place of God and humanity forever. And if you don't know God, you cannot be there. So this is actually a gospel issue. It is a, it is a salvation issue. Like death and judgment and hell, talk of heaven should make us ask, am I saved? Am I born of God's Spirit? Am I born again? Am I a child of God? Is God at the center? Because if he's not at the center now, he will not be at the center after this life. Three questions may help us to really grasp this topic and apply it to ourselves. And the first question is, where is heaven? In biblical thought, where is heaven? Heaven seems to be pre presented in the Bible as a place as somewhere where people or angels or where God himself can live. But where is heaven? Using the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the Greek that the New Testament was written in, we find the language of heaven and the language of paradise is used and the, the heavenly language can apply to three very distinctive tiers, if you like. The sort of bottom tier of heaven is the sky. The birds of the air are in the heavens. Well, that's heaven one, if you like. But above, beyond heaven one, is heaven two. And that's what we might call space or the place where the stars and the heavenly bodies and the planets can be found. So astronomy explores what goes beyond the atmosphere, beyond the air, beyond the sky, is heaven too, where the stars are to be found. And, and the Bible talks about where the birds fly as heaven, sky, 
and where the stars are as heaven. But then the Bible also talks about a level beyond that space-time creation that we can study with our radio telescopes and look upon with our eyes. And that is what the Bible very deliberately calls the third heaven. And the third heaven is beyond what we can measure with science. It is the place where God is, where God's glory is, where God dwells. Now in our readings tonight, the familiar reading from the upper room, John 14, Jesus says, I'm leaving and I'm going to prepare a place for you and I will come again so that I can bring you to be with me. And that place where he's going beyond the cross, he calls his father's house. And Thomas, he speaks maybe more honestly than the other the disciples who were there, he says, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't know where you're going. And Jesus explains, I am the way. And the way to salvation and the way to this place that we can call heaven, the Father's house, is through Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father who is in heaven except through Jesus. In the second reading that we had in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul uh, is debating, maybe even teasing, the boastful and proud Corinthians who think rather too highly of themselves. And he says, oh, you want to boast, do you? About your knowledge and your achievements? Well, I wouldn't boast about myself. I'm just Paul. You know, Paul knows nothing. But I would boast about a man who 14 years ago was caught up by God into the third heaven and saw things he can't describe to you. It wouldn't be lawful to talk to you about the things I heard and the things I saw when God took me to heaven. The third heaven. Paul saw the glory of God 14 years before he wrote 2 Corinthians. I'll boast about a man like that, but of course I won't boast about myself. Paul had a very dry sense of humor. But Paul was saying, I've seen him to heaven, God's heaven. And the way to see into heaven, the way to belong in heaven, is of course to belong to Jesus. In that second reading in 2 Corinthians Chapter 12, he also calls it paradise. And that is a, a description that Luke 23 and Revelation 2 also use. Sometimes the Bible will call this place where God and his glory appears the heavenly Jerusalem or the eternal kingdom or the eternal inheritance or in Hebrews, the better country. You'll find other phrases used to describe this place, those who have gone to reign with Christ, those who have gone to rest in heaven. So the Bible seems to be describing a real place where people can be in the presence of God. But it's not in this universe. You couldn't go and visit it. The way there is through the glorious work of Jesus. That's the first question, where is heaven? And I guess the answer is, where God is, where Jesus is. What is heaven so? That's the second issue tonight. What is heaven? What is it like? Again, we can't say more than the scripture says, and so I'm not going to give you a detailed description but I think it is wise and helpful to draw some lines, if you like, lines of perspective and a work of art. The eye is drawn in, and there are trajectories in the Bible and clues in the Bible, and I think the greatest clues in the Bible to what heaven is like are at the beginning and the end of the Bible. 
the way the sinless creation before the fall is described, and then the way the future after the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven into a renewed creation. The way the Bible begins and ends is in the language of a perfect Eden, a perfect world, a perfect sinless creation. That's a pretty good clue of what heaven and the future new heavens and new earth are all like. And in terms of environment and experience and life, it's a world free of, free of death, free of terror, free of sadness, free of frustrations, free of failures, free of broken relationships. Everything that causes grief and frustration is the fruit of sin and the fall, and that will be gone in heaven and gone in the new creation. Revelation describes it as the absence of pain and conflict. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more death, no more pain, no more night even. All the terrible, scary things gone. If you visit Edinburgh and go to the kirkyard of Greyfriars Kirk, there is a monument there to some of those thousands of martyrs from the covenanting time. Some were held as prisoners in the open air there, summer and winter. About 18,000 Scots were martyred in these dreadful times. And the monument to the covenanters has the words of Revelation 7 written on it. You know what John says in Revelation 7? He saw a vision. And one of the elders asked me, these you can see in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? And John confesses he doesn't know. Sir, you know. And he gets the answer from the, the elder, the angel who's showing him around. These are those who have come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God. And they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. That's heaven. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. That's heaven. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's a good verse for martyrs. But it's a good verse for the whole church because the whole believing church of God comes through trouble to rest and glory in heaven and after the resurrection in the new heaven and new earth that God will create. So, where is heaven? What is heaven? Finally, who goes to heaven? John 14, Jesus is talking to disciples, those who love him, those who believe in him, and he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms, many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. It's the church washed by Jesus, saved by Jesus, that goes to heaven. Revelation 22, 4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. 1 Peter 1, verse 8 and 9, though you haven't seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Those who are being saved and who long to see the face of their Savior, the Lamb of God, they are those 
to go to heaven, not because they're better than other people, not because they've earned it, but because Jesus died in their place and answered for them and welcomes them. BBC have aired programs on the radio about heaven. Melvin Bragg, one of us in, in, in our time programs, was on heaven and how it was depicted in art. Other programs have um, pictured what people think heaven will be like. Um, celebrities and folk like that, what will your heaven be like? Well, the answers we come up with are nonsense and selfish and really more of what we idolize in the here and now. Poor answers. An endless highway to, to drive on. Great if you like a motorbike or a car. Lots of money. Is that heaven? I'd rather like to think we could dispense with cash. Wouldn't you like to think that? Being able to do whatever I want without bad consequences. Is that heaven? Not getting bored. I can't imagine anything less boring than being in the presence of God with God's people in a perfect world. How could you get bored there? The thing about these BBC radio programs where people speculate about heaven is nobody mentions God. Nobody mentions Jesus. Nobody mentions being a worshiper. Because nobody has started enjoying a relationship with the God of heaven now. In order to prepare them for a relationship with the God of heaven then. Psalm 10 verse 4 describes the folly of godless men and women, unbelieving men and women. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him in all his thoughts. There is no room for God. So I finish where I started. Who goes to heaven? Those with no room in their hearts and minds for God will not go to heaven because heaven would be hell to them. We need to go to the cross. We need to go to Jesus. And we need to be redeemed, purchased, saved, forgiven in order to begin to know God and to long for more of God. If I die today, the simple fact that I die will not make me a better person. If I die a wicked man, I'll still be a wicked man. Job says, as a tree falls, so shall it lie. But if I die believing in Jesus, I go to be with Christ because he's my savior. Don't make the mistake of trying to live without God. For if we live without God, we die without God and we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Four last things, things that are serious, Things that require us to ask, do I know God? And if I don't know God, nothing should make you stop or hesitate from asking Jesus right now to take away your sin and your unbelief and to be your saviour. May God bless our time together and bless our thoughts. In a moment, uh, I'll ask Sandy to pray, um, and then we'll be praying around tables. Uh, we'll, we'll sing as well. Um, I'll just mention a few things we might want to pray about uh, this evening. In terms of global prayer, we have our mission partners that we support as a church. And 
I draw to your attention an app that you can download if you use a phone or a tablet called Unreached People of the Day. There are thousands of people groups of distinct language groups and tribal groups around the world who have never received the gospel or only a handful of people from these people groups have encountered Christianity. We should be praying about people groups like that. Today, if you use that particular app, people around the world are praying for the Maba people who live in central Chad. Chad is in North Africa, below the Sahara, not far from Sudan, south of Libya. It's a huge country, huge population, and there are 600,000 Maba people there. They're, they're Muslims. Maybe a handful of them have come to Christ. But they're a, a powerful, respected, influential group within the society of Chad. If there was a gospel movement among the Maba, maybe other Muslims would notice as well and cry out to Jesus. So maybe we could pray for them. Perhaps we could be praying for church plants, and I would mention uh, plans to plant in the east end of Glasgow, uh, some of those finishing their studies at Edinburgh Theological Seminary hope to plant a church very soon in the East End and then in the future north of Glasgow in Bearsden and Milgai, uh, the congregation that was Glasgow City, now Crow Road, is hoping to plant there. The old motto of Glasgow is let Glasgow flourish by the preaching of thy word and the praising of thy name. How that largest city in Scotland needs to be won again for Jesus. Uh, to date, most of our church planting in Scotland has been on the east coast. It would be wonderful to see more planting in the west and in the southwest and in rural parts too. Um, so, um, Sandy, if you'd lead us in a word of prayer, then we'll sing together Psalm 57. Our gracious God, we come and we continue in your presence as we pray to you, as we worship you, as we draw near, as we come in the Saviour's name. We thank you that we can come to you and find access into your presence. And we pray that you would bless uh, our time as we have gathered around your word and as we have meditated upon it. We thank you that Jesus, the man from heaven, has come into our world and has made you known and has spoken to us of these things, so that we in turn might know him and trust in him and be forever with him. We're reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul who could say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so we ask that that might be what characterizes our lives, that we might indeed seek to live for your glory and honor you and serve you in this world and go to be with you when we leave this world. We thank you, Lord, for that glorious hope that we have. And we pray that you would help us in our witness, in our walk with you, as we meet others who may be confused and who may make assumptions that are not based on your truth. Lord, grant us grace and wisdom, we pray, so that we might be able to speak a word in season and be able to testify to the truth of your word and the way that we can know you, know you now in this world, and know you in the life to come. We remember also the work of the gospel in so many places. We think of the peop your people who are persecuted, who suffer in so many parts of the world. We think of Africa, we are reminded of it as we've been hearing about the Maba people in Chad, and we ask, O oh Lord, that you would uh, bring light into their darkness. We think of countries in that area. We think of Sudan, where there is unrest, where there has been a, a civil war and much suffering. 
Lord, we remember our, our brother and our friend, Patrick Jock, uh, from the Reformed Church. We pray for him and his family uh, and all who are connected with him, that they might be kept and that they might be blessed by you. We think of your people also in uh, Nigeria and, and these other countries where so many have suffered again from uh, Muslim uh, influence and activity. Lord, have mercy, we pray. Keep your own people. Grant them your grace your strength and your wisdom even in these days. We think also of the work of church planting and we thank you, Lord, for uh, the vision that we have to see 30 churches planted by 2030. Lord, we ask that you would continue to raise up workers and gospel ministers who will be able to serve you and who will go to these places where there is no uh, gospel witness. Lord, we ask that you would give grace. Lead us, O oh Lord, we pray, and continue with us as we continue in prayer to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together from Sing Psalms 57. in prayer at our tables encourage those at home to pray and we wish those at home God's peace and blessing